Hi everybody, so today I want to make a video that talks about the way in which we seek peace. In these troubled times, we are truly in a position where we need to find peace. And the thing is that there are many ways that we can find peace in this world. And today I'm going to kind of walk through some different ways that I've tried to find peace. And by looking at these different ways and methods by which we can find peace, we can really gain a sense and an understanding of what we actually have in our Catholic faith that is unique. And so by taking this tour of different methods of finding peace, we will be able to see that in our Catholic faith, there is this unique capacity for finding peace, despite the fact that, that there are real failings that we can have in finding peace. And we fortunately can realize that the main difficulty that we have is not fully living out um, the spirit of our Catholic faith, which is exactly that, the spirit of trust in God. We're going to begin by looking at different ways that I've tried to find peace in my life and to explain why these methods have not yielded um, a real healthy kind of peace in my own experience. And the reason for this, um, we're going to basically take a tour um, that's going to bring us through different forms of spirituality. We're going to begin with forms of spirituality that are centered on the level of the, the body. Because there are some forms of spirituality that, that, that actually don't emphasize the spirit. And we are going to explore some of those today and see my own experience in dealing with those things. Um, and these are forms of spirituality that involve forms of meditation that come from things like Buddhism and Hinduism. And so we're going to look at those methods of approaching God and the kind of peace that they give us and realize why those types of peace are not ultimately what we desire. Then we're going to take a look and see uh, types of peace that we can obtain on a level of the mind and a level of uh, thinking and thought, which is, you know, something that was explored extensively by the ancient philosophers in Greece and Rome, especially in the school of thought known as Stoicism. And in the Stoic philosophy, um, there was this sense of being able to find peace by um, letting real thinking about the way things naturally go and the way things are in the world and matching up our minds with that. But we're going to find that that kind of peace, that, that mental peace, is not enough. What we're looking for deeply in our lives is this sense of peace of heart. We're looking to experience the kind of peace that really um, comes from our hearts, that doesn't, um, that doesn't really, uh, you know, that is not something that is um, something that, you know, is, is merely at the level of body or mind. It has to be something that uh, truly encompasses the core of our being, that truly uh, takes us where we are longing to go. And so what we are going to try to do um, is to see why uh, the, the Buddhist type approaches and the Stoic approaches don't give us the type of peace that we're looking for. In today's troubled world, there's a lot of suffering. Right now, we are in the sense of uh, social isolation and uh, all the other protocols that are involved in um, this uh, type of social distancing and uh, these COVID-19 protocols. And the thing is that we have to realize that in a time like this, we require answers to the deep questions of human existence. We need to know what is the purpose of suffering and we need to have practical answers because people are actually dying and we need to have um, a sense of what our life is about and realize what what 
philosophy is true, what, what uh, religion poses the correct answers. And uh, this is a way of making sense of suffering, not in, a, in an escapist kind of a way, but in, in the, the only way that we really can, uh, as humans, make sense of this, in a way that is practical. And so hopefully today's presentation, we'll be able to see some practical answers to the sufferings and the problems that we have as humans, and how in Catholicism we have an actual cure for the human condition. And so this is what we're going to explore today. We're going to begin with the the motives that uh, brought me to actually seek peace, you know, as a young person, to seek peace in philosophies that are similar to Buddhism and Hinduism. There's great differences between these schools of thought and great differences between many aspects of, uh, you know, these traditions themselves. Um, but to sum this up, there are, if we, there are ways of seeking peace that are, uh, that see, that are very, you know, have a depth to them. Um, you know, there, there are ways of seeking peace that have a, a deep, um, there's a deep method to these means of seeking peace. But all these means of seeking peace that come from these, uh, these certain faiths, you know, like Buddhism and Hinduism, involve uh, our soul getting in touch with aspects of the body. We can see this very clearly in the illustration of yoga the body and the mind being joined. And essentially the goal in a lot of these meditations, it's, it's, it's a very in-depth tradition, but the essential thing that is done is that the mind is turned off through focus on the body. Essentially, this is the essence of some of this approach. This is also true in the very popular technique um, which was actually condemned by the Spanish uh, bishops conferences um, called mindfulness, which is, is not um, appropriate for those who are Catholic. Um, it does not match with our way of understanding the person, the way our way of understanding the soul. Um, the, the essential motion of these ways of contemplating God and trying to find peace and freedom from suffering is to pay attention to the present moment, to pay attention to sensations and to notice our thoughts going through our minds. But as you can see, if I pay attention to the sensation of maybe putting my hand on this chair, the sensation of like what the clothes feel like on my body, it does lead to a kind of peace. It was a kind of peace that I found very attractive when I was young and had a lot of different um, mental struggles and confusions. And it was helpful to calm myself down, to pay attention to um, the sensations that were, you know, available to me in my environment. This was something that was a, a real liberation for me um, to, you know, I remember being very distraught and you're just lying in my bed as an adolescent kid, you know, paying attention to just the feel of the covers on top of me in the bed. Um, this really was very um, peaceful and there is a real kind of peace that can be found in these techniques. The real problem with this uh, is brought up in the document uh, called um, A Letter to the Bishops on Some Aspects of Christian Meditation. And this document is one which, which talks about this fact that we can confuse this mere natural peace with the peace that comes from God. If we um, if we engage in this type of a practice where we're merely paying attention to sensations and so on and so forth, we can still our minds. We can find peace. But it is not for us to do this as Catholics because we have better methods of doing this same goal that are, uh, are more powerful, more effective, and encompass the real d the depth of the human soul. It doesn't stop the human soul at the level of the senses, at the level of the body. And if we do that, we're going to cut off our spiritual growth, and we're going to actually start focusing uh, our minds in an incorrect way for what a human being is. And so what's going to happen is if we pay attention to these sensations, we're going to find peace, but we're going to be basically turning our soul 
in on our body, kind of, focusing on the senses. Um, as, and this is the substance of a lot of these spiritual practices. So we can find this peace, and it is an answer to human suffering. When faced with things like COVID-19, uh, we could see how there is an uh, attractiveness to paying attention to living in the moment, to um, savoring those moments of peace, uh, to being here in the now, rather than worrying about um, uh, financial struggles and physical health problems and all these different things that COVID-19 composed for families and individuals. But the problem here is that in this, um, in this method of finding peace, there really isn't a solution to these issues, and it ultimately, as I said, brings the soul into an incorrect state that we as Catholics are not called to explore because we have better options. But, but, it, but it is something that people can really get sidetracked in, and there's a lot of depth there. We have to respect the depth um, in those people that are, you know, um, practicing these traditions, but we also have to be very clear in, um, you know, being able to correct the, the deadly error of, you know, that was uh, cited in that church document, that we can mistake the feelings of our physical created body of, of, of paying this, this stillness that we can get from um, just paying attention to sensations in the moment, we can use that as a replacement. It kind of tastes a little bit like eternity, and it makes us lose our taste for God. When we live in the now, we can lose our taste for eternity because it has a little bit of a resemblance to eternity. It kind of gets to that place in us, and it can really wean us off of God in a terrible way, and we don't want to explore those type of paths and make those mistakes in our spiritual life. It's not for us. The other way that we can try to find peace is through Stoicism. Now, a Stoic looking at COVID-19, looking at this situation, would really say that it is the way of the world that um, epidemics arise. A Stoic is something like, um, you know, a Stoic looks at things instead of the, the Buddhist, which looks at things in a, in a, um, a, a way that is not, uh, that was through the body. The contemplation happens through the body. And there's a sense that everything is one because we're um, bringing our contemplation to the body. The Stoic is somebody who looks at the world through the lens of the mind only. There's no heart activation as a Stoic. It's the mind. It's not, it's not the body necessarily as much as the Buddhist type approach, but it's this movement toward the mind. And this sense of the mind being a... Um, a, uh, a means for, um, for really trying to um, engage with the world and, and experience the divine is also problematic because it leads, you know, when we look at the world and we say, what is the way things are? We say, okay, well, the nature of a human being is to die. That's what a Stoic would say to the people dying of COVID-19. It is your nature to die. Humans are mortal. Why are you upset about the way things are? It is the nature of this world to contain loss. Why are you upset that loss and, and illness have come? Because obviously your mind is not thinking about things according to their nature. And so the Stoics' goal is always to think about things according to the way that they perceive things to be. So they say, yes, humans are mortal. So I shouldn't be upset when I die because I should prepare myself and understand that that's the way things go. And this is a, was, a, was a very advanced uh, um, school of thought that you know is essentially the Western counterpart to Buddhism. It's very underemphasized. Um, uh, Stoicism is as in depth of a tradition philosophically and even religiously. Um, as uh, the Eastern religions, and it, it, in terms of just uh, thinking about these different things, it should be included as something that you know is is worthy, of course, of study um, and understanding. You know, as as a um, as a as a train of thought. But still, as Catholics, we we have more than this. We don't merely have this need to um, just accept the way things go. And, you know, the, 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 the result of this is to believe, if we're just saying, okay, um, 
there's a certain way that things are, and that's the way things are, and that's all there is, this level of mind. There's this element of Stoicism which looks um, just like the, the, the level of mysticism of Buddhism with the body, finding peace with that. Um, you know, that really brings about this sense of everything being one. And Stoicism leads this kind of similarly, this similar type of sensation of um, everything uh, kind of having this rationality in it, because that's how we're perceiving it. You know, we're perceiving life through our mind, not our hearts. Um, and we find a kind of peace that's at the level of mind. And again, we can get stuck here. We can say, okay, I have this kind of peace that comes from my mind. What need do I have for the peace of Christ? And we can have this uh, dangerous trap of, again, just finding peace not in our body like a Buddhist, but in our mind like a Stoic. And looking at this uh, tragedy of COVID-19, we could, you know, be like a Buddhist or Hindu, you know, and say, okay, everything's one and there's, there's no personality, there's no self. Nobody's dying of this. There's nothing, nothing, um, and this is not um, belittling in any way. The, the, this is an actual perception that these these folks have, and a perception that I've had, you know, when I've engaged in these traditions, and but it's an inaccurate perception. It's a sense that everything is one because of the way you're putting your mind into your body, but you're really just blinding your mind by putting it into the body, but it feels like everything's one, and that helps us to kind of get out of suffering, because say, okay, no one exists, nothing, every, nobody's dying because you have this inward sense that everything is one because you're kind of submerging your mind into your body. And the same thing kind of happens when you kind of keep your mind at the level of mind. You know, I mean, it's better than submerging it in the body. But there's this sense kind of where everything is, okay, that's just the way things are. And you kind of just become a robot or a computer. You're, you're, not, you're not capturing the heart. You're not capturing the heart. You, know, you become kind of heartless. Um, you become kind of robotic and computerized. You're not fully human. And so we realize that the only recipe, you know, for getting out of suffering as a human is, you know, um, you know, they used to have those commercials, this is your brain on drugs. Well, the only way that you act, this, your brain seems human is when your brain is on God, not on drugs. Um, you know, the, the thing is that you have this sense that the, the, the first time, I think there's a real way in which the first time we've seen what a human looks like, what a human is supposed to be, is when we see, you know, Mary and Jesus, we see their full, um, we see the new Adam and the new Eve, essentially. We see, um, we see what human, that, that this is this, this depth of sorrow, joy. If we look at even the rosary, it gives us the, the sorrowful, joyful, and uh, glorious uh, mysteries that are, pertain to, um, you know, they pertain to this, the reality of life, the reality of life that's this full human spectrum. And that's the kind of peace that Catholicism calls us to have. It's this kind of peace that is very real and very human. And I want to give a few different um, uh, things here, you know, because um, whereas we spoke about the, the, the peace of that Buddhist method, you know, that really doesn't give us, you know, all that much of a way of dealing with um, COVID-19, obviously, you know, um, there's this real sense of, you know, okay, it can help us um, perceive everything to be one. And, you know, if we do things like yoga, you know, we might have a healthy body, you know, for this body-centered mysticism. Of course, we're going to have very dangerous spiritual side effects of this thing, so this is not for Catholics to do. The next uh, piece of this would be, you know, if we had this stoic mindset, you know, well, stoics do have some, some ability, you know, there's that, that um, you know, do the things, we, it's the sense of the stoics, you know, doing the things they can and leaving the, and, and uh, you know, not trying to control more than they can control. Yeah, I mean, that's good. Um, that's praiseworthy, you know, to try to solve as much of the problems as you can, to serve others, to engage in society. The stoics were all about that. But still, there's this uh, sense in which, you know, you do your social duties, you know, and just let the rest, uh, the, the rest, the way it goes, the way it goes. That's kind of the stoic attitude, you know, just letting things um, be whatever, you know. But the thing really is that in, you know, it, it, it doesn't really solve the problem because the problem is somebody in a hospital bed somewhere who's gasping for air. 
how does this get solved? You know, how does this become meaningful? How does somebody losing everything become meaningful? How do these problems become meaningful? And the answer is that we can find a meaning in Christ. And I want to explain why. Um, the, first, the first thing is that in Christ, um, there is, first of all, um, there's this, these hints Christ, when I remember when I tried to first believe in um, trying to understand what Christ did on the cross, and this is an area you know that is um, is 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 a di- area of division uh, for a lot of Christians. You know, there's um, some there's lots of different theories of what it means that Christ died on the cross. And we're going to explore a little bit of that in this video, but not super in depth. But there's this sense that you know I had. And I, I, I couldn't understand what this meant, that Christ died for me, until I went to a presentation at uh, St. Rose of Lima Church, and it was run by one of the uh, Marians of the Immaculate Conception. And he talked, it was actually, I think, my first time going to St. Rose of Lima Church in um, York, Pennsylvania. And I saw this, um, this one priest, and he gave a lecture about the Divine Mercy image the meaning of the Divine Mercy image. And he really uh, showed me the, um, the symbolism of the Israelite priesthood, the, the Jewish priesthood in um, the uh, image of the Divine Mercy image. And this made me realize that what Christ did on the cross was uh, an act of priesthood, a prayerful act, that his suffering was an offering, that he was essentially making a sacrifice to God prayerfully. And that made me under that just for some reason helped me to really understand how it could be that somebody's death all those years ago could matter at all for all of us living today. It's because it was done by God in a state of by God man in a state of prayer, making it an offering to God and you know, joining you know, doing this amazing weird prayer of offering up his suffering and death on our behalf. And it made sense of this for me. I mean, it might sound more complex, but the model that I had was like, kind of like, like it just didn't click because there's some models that can almost seem like, well, God wants to beat us up, but he beats his son up instead, which there can be, there's certainly some truth of, you know, there's certainly some truth that, you know, yes, God's wrath, there is a tr- truth of God's wrath that is, um, you know, that's mentioned in scripture that that's part of this picture. Um, the Catholic Church also emphasizes, you know, the satisfaction of, you know, um, I think the sense is more of a satisfaction of God's ju- the justice. And, um, you know, St. Anselm of Canterbury has some theories on this, too. There's a lot of different ways of thinking about this. But the problem here is that I couldn't understand how this act, this, this act of suffering, was really an act of priesthood. And that's this thing that, that you know... Um, Christ calls us to be able to do is, is to see suffering as an act of priesthood. And uh, when somebody is suffering in a hospital bed, if they are, you know, if they're a Catholic, you know, if they're reconciled to God, if they're not in a state of mortal sin, um, you know, they are, you know, they are able, you know, they're able to, you know, prayerfully unite their sufferings to Christ. You know, they can, they can, they can offer those sufferings up as part of a priestly, a, a, the common priesthood that we have, nothing is lost. The thing about Catholicism is that there's this sense of that we participate in that priesthood of Christ, making all of our sufferings meaningful and useful for the salvation of souls. That's what distinguishes this, this, this sensibility, you know, in Catholicism of being able to do that. Um, the other thing I want to just also bring up is that, you know, in Catholicism, we have this sense of resurrection, um, and it's uh, this sense of, you know, this, 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 this truth that we are not going to, we're going to get our bodies back. And this is the actual practical solution. Like, you don't, um, you, you don't have a solution, you don't have a cure for the human condition until we get our bodies back. Because a human is not just a mind. A human is a mind-body unity. Um, a human is not just a body. A human is not just a mind human is both. And Catholicism, by operating on the level of heart, enables us to, um, to, to reclaim 
that, to, to make sure that we live in such a way as that we will be able to receive our bodies back. If we follow those other approaches, the Buddhist approach, the Stoic approach, they're not in harmony with what the uni- what's really going to happen to this universe, which is what's this is going to there's going to be a resurrection. And we've seen evidence of this in the um, as Christ was called the, the firstborn from the dead. And there's this way in which this universe is going to have this weird um, phase, you know, eventually where we are all going to be reclaimed and kind of time and eternity shall meet. Um, and there's this weird reality that we have to prepare for. And the way that we do this, the way that we do this, you know, it's not by doing the Buddhist thing where we're getting our mind and soul into caught in our body, or the Stoic thing where we're kind of just at the level of mind. It's by um, changing our hearts. And I think as Catholics, um, especially in this time of quarantine, there's this sense of how are we going to heal our hearts? Because usually the things that, if we really think about this, Christ died to give us the sacraments in a real sense. He died on the cross so that we could receive his body in the Eucharist. He, um, his, his merits of, the, his, of his suffering and his pain atone for our sins and allow there to be confession. Um, and there's this real sense in which even this suffering that we are called to share in, even the sufferings, think about this, I saw my, some of my friends get married over um, a live stream on uh, Facebook because there can't be any guests really, you know, at a wedding anymore. Um, but, you know, I, this was actually my, one of my first Catholic weddings that I've seen, kind of. Um, but the amazing thing here is that, you know, even in a marriage, marriage really matters because it's a sacrament, because it's something done liturgically. It's something that is done in Christ. It's, uh, things only matter because they're sacramental. Things only matter because they're participations in the cross. If I go out and help everybody, as you know, if I go out and help everybody and I don't believe in Christ, it doesn't profit me anything. If I, um... If I don't, because the thing is that my heart's not active, really, you know, my heart is not fully freed, my heart is not properly healed if I'm not um, united to Christ. It's because if I don't do that, um, there's not this supernatural love. There could be human love, you know, the Stoics were uh, very interested in gratitude and, um, you know, a sense of duty to society, but there's not this sense of this um, ex- extreme love that is given to us in God. The problem is that, you know, from, in my own experience, it's very clear that it's hard to have this real sense that we've been loved by God. There are all kinds of problems that we can have, you know, and they correspond even to the levels we've spoken about in our personhood. You know, we can have problems of our body, you know, we can have, you know, uh, we can have a lack of different chemicals in our brain, we can have any, um, we can have things that, that maybe make us uh, jumpier, we can be we can have ways of that we are more agitated just naturally as our personalities. Um, or we can have problems of mind. We can have experiences that uh, and uh, tendencies that allow us to kind of have a, uh, a problem with um, a problem with our understanding of um, ourselves or, you know, maybe some uh, type of obsessions or anxieties or compulsions or different types of problems that could come in the way of us uh, loving each other and feeling loved by God. There's all kinds of obstacles we can experience. And this can make it so that, you know, Catholicism, you know, and we can misinterpret even we can have theological problems and moral problems where we misinterpret God or we misinterpret what the church says. Um, as, as Fulton Sheen, I believe, said, you know, there aren't even that many people in the world who really reject what Catholicism really teaches. Most people will reject what they think it teaches because like, they think it teaches all these horrible things. And sometimes we latch on to the wrong part of a truth, you know. Um, Thomas Jefferson talked about, there was a quote that he had, um, he made many errors theologically, but um, a quote that he had that was useful was that there is a way of holding a thing that is correct in a way that's holding something that's not. And he talked about picking up a pitcher, and there's like an easy handle and a hard handle by which you can lift something. And sometimes we can pick up a truth of Catholicism by the wrong handle. We can think about things, uh, we can say, okay, well, we can think about how um, God is, you know, how there's hell. And we can think about how there's consequences for sins. And we can emphasize that so much that we, that we don't pick up the thing by the handle of God's mercy that would enable us to love God so much 
uh, so as to avoid hell. And so what I want to briefly uh, describe to you are some ways that uh, I, I've really um, failed to um, embody the Catholic tradition and some ways that you can uh, embrace Catholicism in a way that is powerful, especially in this time where we don't have access to the sacraments. Something that I really want to encourage, uh, encourage people to do is to go out and get this book called Holy Confidence by Father Benedict uh, Rogacci. Um, it's, been, it's, it's, a, it's an edition of it being put out by uh, Sophia. I think that's the, the, the publisher. Um, maybe Sophia Institute Press, something like that. Sophia is in the name, though. But this is an excellent book, and you should read this book, and you should practice, read what it says, and you should, I think you really should practice what's in it, because especially in this time when we don't have access to the sacraments, we need to love God more than ever before. Um, not only um, in this time, you know, you know, if we commit a mortal sin uh, at this time, we can't really go to confession. And if we're not really sure if we're in mortal sin, you know, um, we, we really... We, we need to be able to be generating acts of love, uh, faith, hope, and love toward God, and acts of contrition. Um, and, you know, and, you know, there's this, this the, the prayer, the, you know, there's a prayer that's sometimes said at, at the foot of the cro foot of a cross, uh, pr prayer, prayer, prayer before of a prayer before a crucifix, and it says, asks us to ask God to fix within us. Uh, lively sentiments of faith, hope, and charity, um, true contrition for our sins, and a firm purpose of amendment. And that's the thing that we really need to have. We have to have this desire. The, 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 we have to basically do this on our own, in a sense, without the formal help of the priesthood. But we, have, we, but we don't lack the help of God for this. We can cry out to God, um, and we, we need to ask God's help um, in this extraordinary time um, to be able to live the life of faith, hope, and love. And so, um, although it's terribly dangerous, I, don't, I want you to look at it as um, the way I'm trying to look at it for myself, which is an opportunity to confront within myself the lack of trust that I have in God. And Father uh, Rogacci's book about holy confidence points to the central problem of this issue. Because if I were to tell you that Catholicism was the religion of security in God, you would say, no, that's Protestantism. Catholicism is the way you can lose your salvation a million different ways by sinning and breaking all these different rules and all this other stuff. And you know, But the thing is, we want to really look at it this way. Um, Protestantism encourages us to take our salvation sometimes, depending on the school of thought, take our salvation, the, the certainty of our salvation, as a matter of faith. Whereas Catholicism doesn't say that every Christian is saved, will we'll, we'll certainly be saved. We have to participate in our salvation, yielding, and whereas the, in the Protestant view, Salvation is a static thing. It stays still. It doesn't move around. It's just something to believe in. Yep, you're going to go to heaven. Whereas Catholicism, it becomes a lively thing, a dynamic thing. It becomes not merely held at the level of thought or faith or a belief that Christians go to heaven. It becomes something that we have to trust God for. It becomes alive. And the thing that the problem is that as Catholics, we sometimes think that it's something that we shouldn't have at all because we, we, we overemphasize the fact that we can lose our salvation, um, whereas we don't emphasize enough that we are in the hands of God. And the thing is that by, by doing this, I even see this in my own life, I don't have as much confidence and loving, uh, love toward God because I am... Um, I am then my, my, my heart is constricted out of the fear that I will be damned, you know, or out of the fear that I have sinned gravely, um, or out of this some nameless fear. And so the thing is, we, we need to grow in our confidence in God. And Catholicism is the proper religion that allows us to grow in confidence. Because as, as Scott Hahn uh, titled one of his books, um, his book is called A Father That Keeps His Promises. And in Catholicism, we have um, the belief that God is a father that keeps his promises. In Protestantism, there is this sense that, you know, God kind of left the church to go into error, you know, for 
who knows how many years, you know, as the Catholic Church spread and was the main form of Christianity. Um, so there's this sense that, you know, God's promise the Holy Spirit would lead us into all truth was kind of not kept. Um, or in Orthodoxy, there's this sense of, you know, the promises to Peter are not kept. You know, the promises that um, when the Eastern Orthodox Church doesn't honor the, uh, the truth that the, the papacy is revealed to us as part of God's new covenant with humanity, which is embodied in the Catholic Church. Um, we don't, uh, we see this thing that this new covenant community has this office of the Petrine office of the Pope, and that's rejected by the Eastern Orthodox. And so there's a way in which God has not kept his promises there. So in terms of Christianity, Catholicism is the religion where God has kept his promises. It's actually the natural home for trust, whereas um, Protestantism sometimes seems to have that monopoly on being a religion of faith and trust because there's this sense of, you know, these beliefs about the eternal security of our salvation but that merely puts it on a level of this static type of belief, whereas Catholics were called this dynamic trust um, in God. Of course, it's easier to talk about this than to live it because of the obstacles to trust that dwell in our hearts, which is why it's important to spend time daily meditating on God and feeding off of the truths of Scripture and tradition that lead us to believe that we have a Father who keeps His promises. And, um, you know, even there are many things in this book by uh, Father Ragacci that really help us to understand that the natural home of trust is in Catholicism. And that, you know, in these times of struggle and uncertainty with COVID-19, we need to embody trust. We need to live out trust so that our hearts can be set on fire because the thing is that we need trust in order to be able to love God, to have faith in God, to have hope in God, to make these acts even of perfect contrition, because we need to believe that God is a merciful and lovable God, a God who can hear us, a God who will hear our prayers. And this, this, this trust becomes a foundation for our ability to make the proper kinds of acts of love toward God. It can be a great help in this regard, it may not be possible, you know, to 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 make such acts toward a God we don't think is trustworthy. So I think there's a great advantage that to, and the thing really is that God deserves our trust. God deserves our trust, and we need to trust Him because there is no happiness that we can have without trusting in God. And so finally, we have seen different types of peace in this talk. We have seen different ways of thinking about peace. We have thought about the Buddhist kind of peace that happens um, at the level of the body, putting the soul and mind into the body, the kind of level of mind for the Stoic. And now we've thought about the level of the heart, which is dealt with in Catholicism. And so in this way, we are called into the real life that Christ wants for us, we are called into the cure for the, not only, for the cure of the human condition. The cure for the human condition is Christ. That's what the real answer is. Even beyond the cure for COVID-19, the cure for the human condition is Christ and his church and, um, and, and the love and trust that we bear him, the faith, hope, and love the, the, the true contrition, the perfect contrition for our sins, and that firm purpose of confessing them and amending our life, these are the things that we have to hold on to in these times of separation from the sacraments. He died to give us the Eucharist. He died to give us confession. He died to give us all the sacraments that we have. You know, he was faithful to us, you know, and in a sense, you know, maybe there's a sense, you know, in which, you know, even marriage, you know, is, you know, is truly, you know, the image of his faithfulness, is his faithfulness, even, uh, uh, you know, uh, his faithful witness to, uh, faithful even to death on a cross, you know, giving his life for the bride of Christ, the church. Um, and so there's all these ways in which we are called in this time of trial to trust because just like Christ suffered on that cross, 
We are called to suffer for one another, to prayerfully suffer. And that's what makes all of our sufferings meaningful. There's no purpose to any of our sufferings or efforts without the offering that we can make of them to God. And the effort, and, and we have to think about this, that the, the effect we have on others is primarily unseen, just like Christ. I mean, Christ is not Superman. He doesn't save the world by like blocking a giant asteroid. He saves the world by suffering and dying. And that means that we can save the world by suffering and dying. Some little grandma dying in a bed in Italy can save the souls of some horrible, you know, murderer on death row in California or whatever. You know, I mean, it, wherever the world is, you know, it's like there, there's the sufferings that we offer up in Christ are, you know, as St. Paul said, you know, he says, I, I, I make up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ in my body, you know, for the church and all this. He uses this kind of language of this participatory priesthood, this common priesthood that we have in Christ. And that's really the answer to this type of all these sufferings. We have to offer them up. And we also have to have this hope that, you know, that all the people who die, you know, everybody's, everyone is going to get resurrected. Just it's going to be really unpleasant for some people to be repackaged. Because the basic thing is that, you know, you are going to be repackaged. You are going to get your body back. The question is, are you going to have used your, your mind and your heart in the right way that you will be able to have a good resurrection? Will you have used your mind and heart in Christ? Or will you have used them in a way to, to love the body and the world and the flesh? You know, because you can find peace in other ways too. We talked about just the ways that are kind of in religions. But, you know, you can like find peace uh, saying, okay, let me drink a ton of alcohol. Let me, um, let me, uh, you know, find peace in, uh, you know, all kinds of, you know, negative things and sinful habits. You know, we can find a kind of peace or satisfaction to kind of like fill that void, but it really doesn't work. But we still, we have to run the human system the right way. We have to run it in Christ so that we can be a part of the cure for the human condition. And it's so important in these times to remember that we are going to, there is going to be a resurrection. This universe, you know, is subject to the bondage of decay. And something really weird is going to happen to this whole universe, just like, or however that works, or there's at least there's going to be a, there's going to be a place for us. The, you know, in the creed we affirm, and the life of the age to come, this weird thing. Christ, this what kind of happened, but we saw this evidence of working on with Christ, you know, when he resurrects, this is going to happen. This is, this is going to happen to everybody. We're going to be taken up into some, this weird transformation. There's hope for humanity. There's hope for every person. Every person who died from coronavirus is going to get their body back. That is what we believe, and we say that every Sunday. Do we believe that? That we're going to get our bodies back? Does, does that get through to our hearts and our minds? We have to believe that. Because that's our hope. That's the cure for the human condition. That we, like Christ, can suffer and offer up our suffering in Christ, and then we will rise well because we've been redeemed in Christ. That's the hope, the cure for the human condition. That's why Christ is the Savior of the world, the Messiah. And that's what we have to believe, because that's what gives us hope. So here's the takeaways. Trust God. Get that book. Um, we'll read that book. But we'll be talking about this a lot. Um, this, uh, this sense of, um, you know, this need for trust. And lastly, I want to I want to close with um, with a story. And this story happened um, just a few days ago. Uh, my friend was leading um, an online rosary, and I went outside. And when I went outside, I was praying the rosary. And somehow, when I went out there, I thought there was something. I looked around and I I heard something behind me. I felt something was watching me. I was like. Is there like a fox or something going to come out? Or I didn't know what it was. But then a few minutes later, I heard a little chirp. Like, chirp, chirp. And all of a sudden, there was this little bird. It was a little, like a little bird. And all of a sudden, I'm holding the rosary in my hand. And also, the bird like jumps on my leg. And it hops up my leg, kind of near the rosary. I was like, it's going to bite the rosary. And then it jumps. It goes into my jacket. And it like takes refuge in my jacket. And so I'm shocked. I'm trying to get my phone out to, to, to film it, and I got it on film. Um, and, and then eventually it, it, it eventually it fell out. And then 
it got back on my other leg. It, it, hop, it hopped along, it went on my shoe, it jumped, and then it climbed my leg again. And it went back into my shirt, and then it went all the way up to my, went all the way in, and then it was starting to crawl up my sleeve and go down my arm. It was really just trying to nestle in and get warm. While I'm praying the rosary out there. And so I tried to finish praying the rosary, and I was like trying to film it, because I figured the bird's going to leave. I mean, I didn't think he's going to want to stay, but... To make a long story short, it turns out this is a, um, a type of a domestic bird. This is like a, it's not a parakeet, it's a kind of a finch that, you know, people keep as pets. And it's not, this is not the place for him. But what it made me think about is, you know, the, the verses of scripture which say, um, that speak about God's providence. You know, Jesus has told us that, um, not even a sparrow falls to the ground without, you know, our, our, without our Father in Heaven knowing about it. He teaches that. And there's, it depends on how you translate the verse, but he teaches that not that that, that not uh, that our Father in heaven sees everything. You know, even little birds dying in a forest, you know, he'll see no sparrow will fall to the ground, you know, without our Father knowing about it. Even the hairs on our head are numbered, especially the ones on my beard; those are numbered a lot. But um, the one the deal is that there is this sense in which everything is provided for. God is, God's providence encompasses everything. What does this have to do with COVID-19? Well, for me, seeing this little bird and you know, having this bird kind of adopt me, like, touched my heart in an interesting way because I doubt God a lot. But, to, to, but I need to remind myself that in this midst of a global pandemic, God provided for this bird. God God made this bird come to me. Not like meh, made not like not like but in God's grand design of the universe and you know in his providence and guidance of all things, he allowed um you know he provided for this bird. He provided its warmth and you know I've actually adopted the bird now. The bird has now and the bird has a friend now so um the bird's doing well. Um but the bird was provided for in the middle of a global pandemic. God is not asleep on the job. God is forming us into the image and likeness of his son. God provides. All that God does is wise. All that God permits is wise. God is making us like his son. He might bring us to our knees to do that. He might destroy our bodies to do that. But Jesus is a God who gasped for air. Jesus didn't leave out the suffering. You know, Jesus was whipped and beaten, had thorns, crown of thorns pressed into his head. He gasped for air on the cross. He has not left us alone to suffer things that he was not willing to suffer himself. Our God is an awesome God, the most amazing God that could ever be imagined. God who became man and suffered and died and gasped for air, just like people who are gasping for air for coronavirus. And now, in the midst of this, you know, I, I realize, you know, those those verses of Scripture that that call us to look at God and see His providence. You know, I got this little bird, and it helped me in a way to say. You know, yeah, I need to embody trust in God more because, you know, it says in Scripture that, you know, look at the birds of the air. They don't toil or spin, and yet our Heavenly Father feeds them. And they got provided this little birdie over there in a cage sleeping now, um, safe and warm. God feeds them. Trust the providence of God. Love God. Make, make acts of love toward God. All day, as much as you can. Love God as much as you can. Because He's worth it. Because He's worth it. Because He's wise and He's good. You know, we might not always see the purpose that God has in everything that He does. But the purpose that God has in suffering is to make us like the suffering Christ. So that we can be, we can rise with Him. God calls us to life even if he even if he has to permit our death he calls us to eternal life he calls us to something great he 
calls us to the cure of the human condition, even through suffering all the other conditions and diseases that exist. He calls us, that is our calling in Christ. So trust God, love God, have faith, hope, and charity. Let us ask, let us ask God, let us pray together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. O oh God, pour into our hearts lively sentiments of faith, hope, and charity. Grant us true and perfect contrition for every one of our sins. Grant us the desire and firm resolve to confess our sins and amend our lives. Bless us with every grace that we may, in all of our sufferings and trials, serve you. We ask this through Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for listening, and hang in there.